Good afternoon guys, Dr. Ken Norberg with an unusual subject <laughs> today. Usually, well, yeah, usual for me, but unusual for you. It's the wolf problem. You know, if you're a deer hunter in Minnesota and Wisconsin and, and Michigan in particular, uh, you're not very pleased with what's been happening to our deer. Our deer numbers have really dropped considerably in the last 20 years, through no fault of their own. Uh, they've been, the reason we're having problems today is because the, our gray wolves have been protected much too long, uh, primarily by politicians and pro-wolf groups who don't know much about wolves. <laughs> I think I know as much about wolves as anybody who knows a lot about wolves because I've spent about 31 years, well actually longer than that, they're going way back to almost childhood, but I've been around wolves most of my life and I've been studying them scientifically as much as possible uh, since 1970 because they've always been there, they've always been part of living in areas where I've been hunting deer. And uh, things have really come to a head in uh, northeastern Minnesota, in the area we call Arrowhead region. Uh, all that area between Lake Superior and the Canadian border, Ontario, above which wolves are at a historic high in number, as well as in the Arrowhead region now. But here's to give you an idea of what's going on, these are things you should know because the future of our whitetails is going to depend on help from you guys. You're going to have to, you guys are going to have to put in a strong voice in the future to help our deer. <laughs> that might sound crazy, but we're at a point now, you know we have some serious problems out there with chronic wasting disease, but the wolf problem is affecting a great number of us right now, and we're not liking it one bit. And I don't blame you, and I don't like it either. Now, uh, it all started back in oh, 45 years ago with the Endangered Species Act, and it was decided, that, you know, soon after that was uh, enacted, that uh, wolves in northeastern Minnesota were endangered. Now, I won't question that, but I always thought there were plenty of wolves in northeastern Minnesota and I couldn't imagine why they were considered endangered. But at any rate, they were, you know, back there about 45 years ago and deer numbers or wolf numbers were considered to be kind of low and so they needed to be protected. And that protection uh, it brought wolf numbers back up and they've got up to a certain point that leveled up. And the reason it's leveled up, there's other things going on here because of this, with this change in numbers of wolves over a period of 45 years. It's so like I've said it before, you know, if you had 100 cows and you put them in a 10 acre pasture, a lot of nice grass to them, and pretty soon you wouldn't have any grass. They'd eat all the grass and they'd be starving. And everybody would think that's terrible. Well, we've taken all of these wolves and uh, completely protected them for 45 years. That's a huge amount of time. And in the course of doing that, uh, their numbers have grown really high. But they only got to a certain level and it kind of leveled up. So, and like I say, there's reason for that. And the reasons are in here and down here. <laughs> uh, now, during this time, you know, here's, here's about where they, they became protected on this graph, you know, kind of a rough graph, but wolf pack sizes began changing. You know, about, ni about 1990, uh, uh, at that time, when, we, when I first started studying, my current studying area in 1990, we had plenty of wolf sign out there, wolf droppings and wolf tracks in the snow and we'd see them every now and then. All kinds of experiences with wolves there. And, but initially, 
uh, we only heard wolves howl at sundown. You know, it's a rendezvous area. The wolves get active because they would hunt at night. That was pretty exciting for them. They get pretty excited again. Come on, the men, they've been laying around all day and now it's starting to get dark and the sun is about to hit the horizon or drop below the tree line. And they're excited. Boy, now we're going to go hunting. And they're yipping and yapping and howling for short time, not a very long time, but generally it was always right at sundown and you hear them. And we only heard wolves howling at sundown northeast of our camp, one area. And there was, the wolves had a den there close to a, a small stream. And for years they raised pups in that den. <laughs> and, but starting about the beginning of the second week in November when our wolves form packs, you know, they aren't in packs year round. They might be in packs year round on Isle of Oil or on films made by uh, people who like to photograph uh, wolves that seem to indicate that wolves live in packs year round, but they don't. Uh, right after snow melt in the spring, the packs break up and the individual breeding pairs go off on their own and, and pups are born in the spring and they raise the pup and the two wolves do most of the hunting in a much smaller area. Well, the big packs, they'd hunt in an area of size of about 100 square miles. That sounds like a lot, but you say, take an area of 10 miles by 10 miles square, that's 100 square miles. But they would, they would hunt throughout an area of that size all winter long. And uh, having this large size, right, let's say there was 15 to 20 deer per square mile in there, that's a lot of deer. And then what they're looking for is deer they can catch deer that are weakened for some reason. And later in the winter they find lots of deer like that that are weakened by starvation, for example. But I won't go into that. But at any rate, come spring, they, the, the packs break up and they split off and go in their own little areas. And uh, as pairs, these wolves don't hunt 100 square miles or they're at least smaller areas uh, when there's just two of them and they don't need to. And um, uh, they don't form packs again until about uh, the 8th of November. And it's, that's been a magic date in our hunting or in my study here for years. About then, wolves would come together and form a pack. And all of a sudden, you know, or we just had a pair of wolves making tracks in snow or mud or soft places. All of a sudden, there was a bunch of them making tracks together. And the howling we'd hear at sunset was horrendous. Holy cow, it sounded like 100 wolves out there howling. Well, about 2000, year 2000, by that time, we were hearing howling four directions from our camp. Besides our own, our own wolves would be howling in the northeast, but three other directions from camp, distant sights, you could hear them miles away uh, on a quiet evening. And sunset, and they're howling over here, and they're howling over there, and that. by that time, there were four times more big wolf packs in our woods. The numbers had increased, and meanwhile, while that was going on, young wolves were having a hard time trying to find new home ranges of their own, and they were starting to migrate out of that northeastern Minnesota. And they were going as far west as the Dakotas, you know, the eastern ends of the side, edge of the Dakotas, all the way down into the northern part of Iowa, and all across Wisconsin and into upper Michigan. They were migrating and were like never before in our lifetime. It, it, and the reason they were going is there wasn't room for young wolves to find new home ranges in this crowded northeastern Minnesota area. And the fact that Wolves were at a historic high and across the border in Canada. Didn't help matters because those wolves were migrating as well, trying to find young wolves or trying to find new home ranges or hunting ranges of their own. So, spreading all over, this was going on. So, we, something was happening then. You know, and then after 2010, you know, back in the old days when they had the big packs, we'd see eight to twelve wolves in a bunch, and a couple of them would probably be young wolves, pups, half-grown pups. 
and they'd be falling snow, and that was really something to see in those days back in the in the 1990s. A uh, big wolf pack going maybe maybe as many as a dozen, you know, single file going right out in the woods, and a couple of pups falling behind, sniffing deer tracks, and they're all excited, and they get left behind a little bit, and they dash after the big pack after it goes out of sight, and. We didn't know much about what the wolves were doing at the time. Well, we assumed they were hunting for something to eat, but we learned a lot from those wolves in the years that we were there, and having watched what wolves were up to when we were actually hunting. Actually, it helped me to develop six new uh, uh, fair chase stand hunting methods that had been really terrific. We, we learned uh, uh, how do I identify something called mature buck effective stand size? Uh, we, we became particularly deadly at hunting older bucks at ground level using techniques that were taught to us by the wolves. That was really fun and interesting to do that. Well, anyway, back to the graphs here. So, about after 2010, Every time I saw wolves in that time since then, I have never seen a half-grown pup with the, with the parents. There's a possibility we had one this year, a pup. It was half-grown. Well, it looked three-quarters grown, but it was definitely smaller than the other two. But at any rate, uh, what was happening, because they were not getting enough to eat, a uh, lack of nutrition, which is which happens with deer and lots of other wild animals. If they aren't getting enough to eat, they are not going to be as successful at raising pups or even giving birth to live pups or, or, or fawns. And so the DNA numbers are going to start to go down because of that. The pack sizes are going to get smaller and smaller. And the reason for that is most of the wolves that form packs in November are probably former progeny, former young of the two wolves that lived in our, in my study area. They turn out to be the alpha male and female of the packs each year when they'd come together. And these other wolves had similar colorations of fur in their legs and muzzles and body. And, and it, it appeared that, gee, they are related wolves, and that's probably what happens, you know. A wolf pack is a lot of related wolves coming together. And uh, so, but in time, if the wolves are not having babies, you know, and you can have ten wolves living in an area, and five years later, out of, those, out of that ten, there will probably only be five left. You know, there's a lot of mortality in wolves for quite a few reasons. So that alone can reduce pack sizes. And though the numbers, overall numbers of wolves in the area were pretty much the same, way over what they should have been. Actually, they, they probably should have been like this. Uh, those excessive wolves are really killing a lot more deer in two ways. And when they are formed packs, then they can take mature doe away. When there's just two of them, uh, the breeding pair, they can't take mature bucks or does uh, during the summer months unless there's something wrong, really dramatically wrong with those deer. Uh, because deer are much faster. They can run faster than wolves and they can leap over obstacles 25 feet across and 8 feet high and the wolves have to go around. So deer can outrun wolves in the woods they can, and as much as they try. That's one way they're reducing deer numbers. And the other way is, is even worse, when things are really hard, when it's hard for them to find food to feed the pups and stuff in the, in the summertime, the summer like spring, summer, and fall, uh, they really turn on white-tailed fawns. They eat a lot of fawns. They've been eating three out of four of all the fawns that are born in May in my, in my study area for 31 years, every year, from 1990 until 2020, they've been taken. In the spring, we can have uh, almost an average after a mild to or um, 
modern winter, we, all of our older does, those that are two years or older, will have twin fawns. And by November 1st, well, there's only one fawn for every two mature does in our woods. And it, well, <laughs> wolf droppers are, are full of deer hair and unworn, unstained teeth, uh, fawn teeth, and fawn sized dew claws and hoofs. And they don't digest, but the, the, the wolves eat them anyway. They eat a whole fawn and uh, everything. But at any rate, uh, so they're taking a lot of deer out of the population there. And our deer have been having a hard time ever since we started in there. And we only limit our hunting to four mature bucks. Most of them are non-breeding bucks a year. So we're not hurting the population particularly. But the wolves are eating three out of four fawns every year. And uh, that's really hurting. And so as this has been going on, the deer numbers, you know, the usual wintertime mortality and then the summer, spring, fall mortality, the deer numbers are falling, oh, falling constantly. And they've been going, now back in the early, I started hunting uh, grouse and woodcock and, and uh, even a bear uh, up in this, er in this area back in the early 1960s briefly with some friends. In that time there were 22 deer per square mile in this area. A lot of deer. I mean they were everywhere and uh, one little stretch between where we hunted and a little town not so far away we see 50 or more deer feeding along in the ditches in the evenings. And amazing. Just all kinds of deer. Well these numbers have been gradually falling because of what was going on here and today, when we started, when I started my studies in that in 1990, we were already down to 11. You know, the effect of this number climbing up here because of the Endangered Species Act and uh, pro-wolf groups and politicians trying to prevent any hunting or trapping of wolves during all this period and allowing the wolf numbers to grow unfettered for all that time, it was bound to happen. It had to happen. Pretty soon they were going to start running on a deer, and they did. And so there were 11 per square mile there in 1990. Today, there's three to four per square mile. And that is pretty much the number we find almost everywhere in that Arrowhead region between Lake Superior and uh, Ontario border today, and it has been for quite a few years actually. So numbers are way down. So us hunters have been hunting there all these years. We're not very happy about that, you know. But most guys don't understand why that's been happening. What I'm getting around to saying is, you know, there are already pro hunting groups and politics governors. Two governors of the three states I mentioned are against wolf hunting. Um, and that's sad because they want to continue this terrible thing that's been happening. And what's going to happen here? Well, we're going to end up with hardly any deer at all. And then, you know, what, uh, what also happens when this happens, when you get down there with that few deer, those, those wolves got to eat something. They're going to turn on the moose population. They're going to eat a lot of moose. You know, the demise of moose in Minnesota has been a subject of concern for the last five years here. And they keep blaming it on brainworms. So, you know, moose get brainworms, they die from it. But when deer get brainworms, they don't. And so it was decided some years ago that it was the fault of whitetails that moose were dying, which is kind of goofy because they've been together for 10 10,000 years and there have been up and downs in population, but nothing like what's going on right now. It wasn't the brain worms that was making the big difference, it was the reductions in deer numbers that were making them the difference. And so the wolves have to eat, they start turning on moose. And then a lot of those Ontario wolves migrated down into Minnesota, they were used to eating moose, they were good moose killers. Adding to the problem, were already very uh, skilled at taking full-grown moose 
And so they were contributing to, to, to reducing the moose population in Minnesota. And moose population looks like it's been holding its own a little bit now lately. The reason being, when you only have three wolves in a wolf pack, you know, the wolf packs are getting really smaller and smaller as so they're going down and down and down. Uh, what I mentioned, we see these big wolf packs, eight to ten, and plus a couple pups all the time. Since two, 2010, uh, the packs have been getting smaller. At that point, we were looking at four to six wolves per pack. Now, if they're not getting babies, and they're having poor nutrition already, which they were, uh, because they were way up here, and these were going downhill here, uh, then we're going to see fewer wolf pups being born. And their packs were getting smaller and smaller. You know, all these related wolves that come back in uh, November 8th and to form a pack just weren't there anymore. So uh, a couple years ago, they were down to four per year. And this last year, they were down to three. Now, three wolves can take a lot of fawns when it's necessary, and they do, uh, but they have a hard time killing uh, mature whitetails and moose. And so the moose population has been coming back a little bit. It's, it, it's gotten to be a little, they're growing, starting to come back more and more. And uh, today there might even be as many moose in our deer hunting area as there are deer. But the deer population just keeps sliding down because uh, of the wolves are keying on fawns during the summer months. So it's not their fault. Now what's needed to straighten all this out is to reduce wolf numbers. We've got to get them back down to normal numbers so that our whitetails can, can have more living fawns come November every, every year and restore deer numbers. We need our near deer numbers to get up to about 15 per square mile, which is pretty nice population for a forest deer, an Ireland forest deer. We get them up to that point, uh, we, don't, we aren't going to be complaining about wolves one bit. Uh, that's going to give us really good hunting and uh, maybe not 22, but that's kind of excessive for a forest area to have that many deer in them. And there's areas in, in many states, the United States to now, where there's up to 30 per square mile, maybe a few even more, because uh, the, a lot of those deer live on private land where people don't want you to hunt deer, and so the population can get out of hand because of that, and in suburban areas as well. But but anyway, by reducing wolf numbers, getting them down there, then we're going to start seeing our deer numbers start coming back up again. And if from that time on, our manager, game managers, our wolf managers, uh, can keep the, the wolf numbers at a kind of a, 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 a normal range throughout this period so that we always have uh, at least 15 deer per square mile from that time on, we're all going to be happy. We won't mind those wolves and because we have really good hunting again. This is not something that can happen in a year or maybe two years. I don't know, it probably can happen in the remainder of my lifetime. It's going to take a while, you know, maybe closer to 10 years before it's finally normal again and everybody's happy. But doggone it, we got, a, we got a fight on our hands, legal fight, you know, with the pro-wolf people. They, they can't be allowed to be treating these wolves like they're treating them right now. They're not, they're, this is what they're doing to the wolves. And there's no crueler way for a wolf to have to live when this is going on. They're starving to death. It's what they're doing. Their wolf numbers are starting to drop. The overall numbers, you know, they're, they're constant up here because when, when you have a normal number of wolves and every winter, they, these wolves will, will hunt throughout an area 100 square miles in size. 
But when you only have two, three wolves in a pack, it won't do any good. They can hunt all they want, and it's going to be hard for them to find enough food in there. They end up staying in a smaller area, and what they're doing today, when they're staying in smaller areas all winter long, they're just being hell on wheels on their fawns and all that kind of, Nothing can change as long as there aren't significant wolf numbers uh, being reduced each year and kept at a certain level, so our deer numbers can increase in size. But when wolf packs with only two to three wolves in there, what you end up is that wolves are hunting in all kinds of small areas, all over. They're all having the same problem, and it allows more of these winter areas, more areas to be hunted by wolves all winter long, but by smaller numbers of wolves. And uh, so, well, what's happened today is that, you know, the wolf packs, wolf packs are getting smaller, but they're hunting in smaller areas, and there's more of them hunting in smaller areas in the winter. So the total number is still the same up here. It doesn't, hasn't changed. It's, instead of one big wolf pack hunting in a square mile area, now we've got a whole bunch of three, four, you know, two to four member wolf packs hunting in small areas throughout the whole area, and so the total number is the same. Same excessive number. So, for the wolf's sake, they need to be reduced in number. Just like if you have too many cows in the pasture and there's no more grass, that's crazy to just keep going on and on and preventing them from living in a larger area, reducing their numbers, so that you, ha you have a proper number that can live in that amount of space or, or that amount of grass. So it's crazy to just keep starving our wolves until it finally maybe there won't be any. <laughs> well, that's that's a cruel way to treat wolves. It, people who don't want wolves being hunted or trapped are are doing are not doing any favor for wolves. That is a terrible thing, and what they're doing to the wolves. So we got to get around and look at things the way it should be done scientifically, and we should get busy and allow our wolf managers to do their job, and they'll do it well. And we're never going to, we're never going to reduce wolves into extinction as long as we have uh, trained people managing our wolves. There will always be a lot of wolves in the woods, but they got, for them to have enough to eat, they got to be reduced in numbers so you can get deer back into uh, numbers that can take care of all those wolves each year. So that's where we are now. We need to reduce numbers. So. White tails can recover to, let's say, it, it, 15. 15 is ideal in their own forest areas. Uh, 15 per square mile, and in doing so, then the wolf packs can recover to being big wolf packs in winter again. And, and uh, overall, fewer wolves in the area, but we'll have normal, healthy wolves finding plenty to eat during the winter months. And that's the way we should have it. So, but it's going to take us deer hunters to make sure it happens. We got, we, you know, every time somebody wants to go to court and get an injunction to stop wolf hunting anywhere, in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, it doesn't matter where it is. Us deer hunters got to raise cane. <laughs> we got to make people understand why it's so necessary to reduce those wolf numbers. And it's good for wolves as well as for deer and not other wildlife as well. So that's got to happen. Well, there's another subject I want to talk to you about when it comes to wolves. Uh, you know, for years and years and years, uh, when I, my first close relationship, and color reports beginning back in the 1990s, uh, I was scared to death. Uh, I remember that first buck I took up in that my study area that year. Took me all day to get that deer to camp. I had a big wolf pack following me all the way to camp, almost to camp. When I finally shot over their heads and made them run away, then 
I finally got away from them, but by that time I was within a half a mile of camp. And, but that was a terrifying day. It really was. I was scared. First time I had six big wolves, big as yearling does, within 10 yards of me and moving closer, I was terrified. That was scary. But then the wolves, when they grow, <laughs> they moved away. They didn't run, they just moved away. And I thought, boy, you know, they're, they're pretty nice animals. No wonder wolves were the ones that were the uh, forefathers of all the pets we have and where all those goofy dogs that love us to death uh, came from wolves. And uh, I was, that must, they just something to a wolf that, that is kind of neat, you know, that way. And I remember some, quite a few years ago, I went on a hunting trip, and I've mentioned this but before, but I was hunting with a, a paw fox. He's a Clinket Indian from Ross River, Yukon Territory. And his, he and others like him made their living as guides for hunting and fishing, that kind of thing, and trapping in the winter. And they, were, they lived with wolves around them all the time. And I remember one day he and I, we were alone, we, had, we went out for the horses to hunt in what was called the Hess Mountains for sh sheep, doll sheep. There were a lot of doll sheep there. And we saw quite a few the first day, but no big rams. And so that evening we were going to do something he called fly capping. And they, the fly was a, was a tarp, and, and he tied ropes to a four corner so it was up off the ground and kind of slanted in case it rained or rain could run off. And we slept on the ground underneath there. And it was getting dark when we got to a spot up next to a little stream there, the headwaters of the Hess River. And, uh, and uh, made supper, we were getting ready to make supper, built a fire and made supper and take care of the horses. They get their oats and their oats bags and that kind of thing. And, and uh, uh, all of a sudden there were wolves howling out in front, close. And we got flashlights and we shined them out and there were eyes glowing in the dark. All our, Oh, about a semicircle around, way from over here, over to here, and then you didn't even need the flashlight really, the eyes were glowing from the firelight, and, and Paul, he was throwing all kinds of brush on that fire and getting a flame going, and they were going up about 20 feet. And finally, we took shots in the air to scare off the wolves, and they left, then they left. And I was kind of kidding him. I said, Paul, well, how come you're so frightened of wolves? And he said, well, well they're dangerous, he said. Uh, they eat people. <laughs> and I said, no, I said, they don't eat people. There's no record of uh, wolves. They may do that in, in uh, Siberia or someplace like that, but no record of any people being killed and eaten by wolves in, in North America that I know of. And I remember him looking at me and saying, well, if you were killed and eaten by a wolf, how are you going to make sure that ends into, that's going to be recorded somewhere by anybody? He says, we've had lots of people killed in my lifetime by, we're certain there was wolves. We'd find their tracks and we'd find the blood and we'd find bits of clothing out in the woods where they had been. And it had to be wolves that did them. And they're dangerous, and especially those big packs, and uh, that's pretty scary. They, 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 those people were most concerned about wolves and grizzly bears. Grizzly bears, well, I can understand being worried about them. But anyway, at this point I was, you know, I said, well, you don't have to worry about wolves, they don't eat people. Well, one day, not too long ago, I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know, I wonder if there's a list of um, wolf attacks in North America. And I looked up, and then, oh, sure enough, uh, Wikipedia had a list. Look at it, it's uh, almost a book. And that's not all of them. You know, not all wolf attacks get recorded. And whereas fatal wolf attacks were not were not real common in North America. 
Uh, they were spread out. The, these records on the fatal wolf the, uh, tax went back to, oh, what year? 1850s. <laughs> That's just a few little pages here. That's about four pages, three pages of tax. I said, well, that's not bad. That's pretty rare. But then I ran into a section called non-fatal tax. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of them. And they were, they were gruesome. In fact, the night after I started reading all these accounts, I made copies of my own. Uh, I was, I had bad dreams about wolves that night. <laughs> I've never felt that way about wolves. Now, in reading this, uh, a lot of times the people like DNR, being manager, to try to figure out why wolves would attack people. There had to be a reason, they felt. And there was three reasons that, that increased the likelihood of an attack by a wolf. One was uh, feeding them. You know, people would go to a place like Algonquin Park up in Canada, and the wolves would try to buy their campsites out there on the backwoods roads, and they'd feed them, throw food to them. And on many attacks, and they usually occurred during the night, like say midnight or two in the morning, Serious things like wolf come into the camp and grab some little kid in a sleeping bag laying out there. They're all laying out there in the open, you know, and they're sleeping. Grab him and start dragging him off into the woods and got a hold of his head or arm or whatever, dragging him away and he's screaming for his life and bleeding like crazy. All kinds of stories like that, and they were all attributed to the fact that somebody found them. It's like feeding bears is a bad thing to do. They'll come back. So you don't want to feed bears, you don't want to feed wolves. That's a bad thing. Well, then they would say, well, my sons and I, and I my hunting partner, we feed, bear, we feed wolves every year. We, they key, uh, they've been keying on our on their um, gut piles for years. They hear us shoot. They know they got an easy meal where that shot occurred. And they'll show up pretty quick there and consume everything but the contents of the stomach, you know, which is at that time of year is browse. They don't like to eat chewed up wood. So, but they'll eat the stomach, and, but there will be that browse land <laughs> on the ground that the deer had, had eaten earlier in the day. So anyway, uh, we've been feeding them. And it, they, we know, they know, we provide the food because when we shoot a gun, there's the food. Good connection. Those deer, those wolves. Now, they've all seen like pretty nice wolves and mind their own business, but there have been at least three occasions when they scared the heck out of me and the rest of us. Like the night when the big pack, and boy, were they hauling and barking, making a wreck right outside our tent. Because we had a buck hanging behind the tent. And that was a terrifying night for all of us. We had, Finally, it, when we got the buck put into the back of my pickup in the topper, put that in there, and, and uh, then they went off a little bit and sat and hauled and hauled and hauled. Finally, we went out there and shot some uh, over their heads and they left, and that we finally got to sleep that night. But that was terrifying that night. And that, the day I had the wolf pack follow me all the way to my camp when I was dragging a buck, that was terrifying. And the day I had that wolf pack only within 10 yards of me, while I was sitting on my stool, <laughs> that was terrifying. But I've never been harmed by a wolf. So that's three times. So I was kind of wondering, when I started reading about all of these accounts of Non-fatal attacks, and when it says non-fatal, some people lost a leg, some lost an arm, some had to have 80 stitches, some had to have plastic surgery on their face to get their face back to no, half partial normalcy. It was just 
some terrible things happening to people. And uh, accounts of a couple of guys, hunters, they have fallen dead and all tore up and they'd kill the wolves later or trap them or something and they'd find clothing and bits of clothing from the hunters in their bellies and that kind of thing. But they'd find them with six, eight, one, one account is 27 wolves laying in the snow that those hunters had shot and they probably ran out of bullets and the rest of them, the wolves that were there, attacked them and killed them and ate them. Those are awful stories. So I said, well, here's one reason we feed the wolves. And they know we feed them when we shoot a gun this way. There's an easy meal. Another thing is, we've been messing around, and I've been returning that wood several times a year, and for a long period, several days at a time, and be out there all day from first light till dark in the evening, and later even. They know us, that our scents, our smell, they know all kinds of things about us. They're well acclimated to being amongst us, and they've learned we don't threaten them, ever. We never give them the impression they need to be terrified of us, be afraid of us, to run away when we come close. They, they know that. And we found tracks of snow where they followed us for very bear hunting and coming out in the dark and wolves followed us right to the camp and things like that. We've had those things happen. So they're acclimated to us. And the other thing um, that increases the likelihood of an attack is hunger. Now, today, we have a lot of hungry, desperately hungry wolves in our woods. And you put those three things together, and that worries me. And I told John, I said, from now on, when we're not carrying a deer rifle, we got to have some kind of a weapon along, a sidearm or something. Because so many people that were attacked were so, they were not com expecting it. It was just boom, all of a sudden here's a wolf coming out of the brush beside the trail and, ch and attacking them, jumping at them, lunging at them, grabbing them, tossing, pulling them to the ground, dragging them away. <laughs> Things like that. If you don't have some kind of a weapon that you can use quickly, like a sidearm, get it out and protect yourself, you could be killed by a wolf. And where, like I say, it's not a common occurrence. Uh, I'm not saying it's more common than being killed by lightning or anything like that, but. Uh, if and when that happens, and I think the likelihood of where my study area is today and what time I've been there, I'm not going to be without a weapon, some way of protecting myself should that happen. We've got star wolves who are not afraid of us, <laughs> and we feed them gut piles. So uh, you put all that together. And then another thing, I, you know, for years and years and years, and every time I go scouting up there, I take my dog along. And he loves them. Oh man, that's more fun. He thinks that's more fun. Well, a dog is bait for wolves. An easy meal. They, they we, these stories all the time here in Minnesota. A wolf comes out and grabs somebody's dog and eats it right there. Before, before, what's inside of him? There's a little pet they have loved for years, and the wolf ate him up right there. Just came out and shook him like a rag doll and went over there and ate it. Uh, so a dog, no matter what size he is, it is no match for a wolf. And so uh, there's wolf hounds, I suppose, but we nobody have uh, we don't have wolf hounds. But at any rate. And, and you have to have a pack of wolf hounds to make it work. But uh, So I'm not going to bring my dog on my field trips anymore up north. Right? Not with all those hungry wolves, so that what remains of them in the woods looking for food. Boy, they got a sniff of Harvey, and that could be the end of Harvey. So 
Anyway, we're going to carry a weapon from now on when we're not deer hunting. And deer hunting, we're well armed, you know, and ready. <laughs> but um, otherwise, uh, we're going to do that. So that's something. Another reason why it's time we get wolf numbers reduced. Get rid of all these things that happen and be, don't be careless when it comes to things you do when you're around wolves. You know, here's a wolf, don't feed them for heaven's sake. Don't, do, don't sleep out in the open at night. Sleep in a tent, you know. And none of the accounts that I've read here, and there's all these accounts, people were, wolves didn't break into tents and drag people out and kill them and eat them. It was just people that were in the open that they did that with. So a tent, even a tent, canvas tent, is a good shelter in wolf country when you're sleeping. So keep that in mind. So anyway, uh, that's the wolf story I have to tell you today. All these things. And there is how many of us, 15 million of us deer hunters in the United States. We are a big voice. But we're bigger than the pro uh, wolf groups. Um, we can make bigger noise. We can, we can be really careful about who we elect into office that might have an effect on, on, uh, on wolf and deer management. So it, it should be a question. Any politician that comes around, you got to ask them what they think about hunting wolves. Maybe they don't know any better. Maybe it's time you educate them. Tell them to look it up. Tell them, to go check out Dr. Norbert's seminars. You'll find out all you need to know about wolves on those seminars, uh, including the seminar that we uh, published on November 2nd in my series of seminars. It's all about wolves. So uh, do whatever you have to do, but become educated about wolves and be ready to, to protect your deer and to give wolves a chance to live normal lives again. And uh, so do that, William. And boy, we're a big group. We got a big voice. We can make that happen. So. Don't let it slip by. Don't let your governor or anybody else tell you there will be no wolf hunting as long as he's in office. But don't let it stand that way. Start raising canes. Talk to your senator, your, your representatives. Talk to those people. Um, but do something to make sure that this imbalance between predator and prey is finally straightened out in your state. And it'll be good for you, and it's good for deer, and good for deer hunting, and good for wolves. Here's another subject about wolves that I think you'll be interested in. You know, last, last November, uh, I encouraged you guys to become interested in the OFO Wildlife Watching Program here in Minnesota. Can sign up on the internet, and, uh, uh, and it's kind of interesting. You know, one of the things they want you to do is to put a, a trail cam on gut piles and in the woods. And uh, I did that too. I expected we wouldn't have much problem photographing wolves when we did this, knowing knowing our wolves were pretty. They were quick at finding our uh, gut piles and consuming them. And so, I, from our quite a few pictures that we got from, from uh, the, the gut pile, uh, from the buck that my son Dave got last year, we got a lot of interesting pictures and uh, some interesting things come out of it. So, good things to know about. So, anyway, Dave got his buck all around, I think it was quarter to nine in the morning, opening morning. And uh, uh, after he, he, he got the deer to camp, I asked him to put my new trail cam 
Well, Anya's gut found, which he did. So he went out there and put it up. Nothing happened there uh, all day after that was put up there. And uh, it was that evening, though, not long after sunset, a wolf showed up. One wolf, a black one. And we look and look at this wolf, and he, he looks like he's a younger wolf. I mean, he might be a, a rare pup of, from the past year, not fully developed yet. And uh, he's, uh, you see, it looks a little smaller than other wolves that we photographed them. And uh, he, sh but he showed up alone. And uh, during the night, he occasionally moved around that gut pile, but he didn't eat it. He didn't eat anything from the gut pile. He laid here and he laid there and that sort of thing. So that was kind of interesting. Then the next day, the sun came up, it was a nice day, and uh, he, would, he had a busy day. He, he didn't eat anything out of that gut pile all day, just that one wolf. He kind of laid here and there around it, usually within eight to ten feet of it. And that day, he was bombarded by by birds. <laughs> it started out with a with a turkey vulture showing up in the morning. We, yeah, we have some in Minnesota, and uh, this time of year, we, that time of year, November, we don't see many of them. But there was one there that that first day in the morning. So there was the turkey vulture, and then the ravens came in. And uh, you know, when a raven finds a gut pile, they they're up there in the air somewhere, and they start a certain type of calling that tells every raven within hearing, there's food, there's food here. And they show up in great numbers in the area. So that's what they were doing. Well, this single wolf spent today keeping birds off that gut pile. None of them got to, they, they would try, they'd hop down the ground and try to sneak in closer and he'd chase them away. Now, one of them got up very close to the gut pile. But it didn't stay there very long because that wolf just kept all those birds out that gut pile all day long. So, what, you know, here we had one show up fairly quickly after that buck was shot, you know, and, and, and it's almost certain he was king on that gunshot 
going, oh yeah, there's a gunshot, that means he's immune. So I went over there. Well, this was on the 8th of November, and it was the day that our wolf pack usually forms. And uh, so, but usually they're, by, by the 8th, they're all there. Well, that evening, finally, uh, just before sunset, a second wolf showed up. It was a large gray wolf. The next wolf to show up was a black one. It was a little larger wolf. And so now we had two black ones. And, and at this point, they start being, well, we could see the glowing eyes of a third wolf in the background. So there were three wolves there at this point. At this point, it was kind of hard to judge whether this was a, the alpha male and female of my study area plus a pup, a grown pup, or not. Kind of hard to judge that. But at, as soon as the other, they came in shortly after got dark in the evening, there was two other wolves. And from that time on, they fed heavily on that gut pile. They ate that pile, so we didn't, we didn't really get a good picture of that, that third wolf. Okay, we got good photographs of two of the wolves, both of them black, and then we had the eyes of the other one that were in the background there, so we knew there was another one there. And the camera wasn't taking pictures snap, snap, snap like that, and apparently got in and fed when it wanted to. I thought it was interesting that, you know, here's a wolf. It came there 24 hours earlier, and he guarded <laughs> the gut pile, never ate a bit of it until the other two wolves showed up. Then they all ate there, cleaned it up, except for the contents of the stomach which is chewed up browse. <laughs> and the next day, because birds were not finding food there, there weren't many showing up. We hardly got any pictures during the day that day. Only three, and uh, they were ravens. Uh, but that evening, uh, the third wolf, we got, finally got a good picture. That it came back shortly after dark in the evening. We checked the gut pile over, and I can't imagine there was not left, but there he was. And he was a really nice looking wolf, a bigger wolf, and a typical gray wolf with the, you know, lots of different colors on its body, and gray sides, and white underneath, and white on its muzzle, and big, beautiful wolf. So, finally got that, that one, so we had two black and one gray. And at this point, the pack should have been complete. So, I'm not sure, but I think the pack was complete to start with. There's three wolves, and uh, none were coming from other areas. And, you know, we knew there were three wolves there because we could see the glowing eyes of one of them. So, but by the third night, we finally got a chance to see the one that we hadn't seen earlier. So, three wolves. No other pictures of wolves. That was it. On the fourth day, only one photo was tripped on the camera. Probably caused by wind moving a tree branch or maybe a bird flying right past the lens or something of that order, but nothing on there. No photos that night. On the fifth day, we only got one photo with nothing on it. On the sixth night, there's something really interesting happened. <laughs> It was kind of a really a surprise. During that evening, the snowflakes were falling, big ones. You <laughs> see white flashes on the, on the screen where the snow was falling. But during that night, a doe showed up at 1.04 a.m. right there in the area where the gut pile was. It's not there anymore. But a mature doe walked through that area. And then, only four minutes later at 1.08, a bull moose showed up. <laughs> you know, they, they didn't have huge antlers, but they were pretty decent. A nice looking moose, bull moose, walked right through that same area, right there. And then, 
An, a buck showed up at 4 a.m. A big buck. Yeah, bigger than the one Dave took on opening morning. Really nice buck. The next day, the seventh day, it was a nice, beautiful day. The snow had melted, and uh, a beautiful doe walked. It might have been the same doe we got during the night, and, you know, the night before. Walked through that same spot. What was kind of interesting about this is it uh, kind of uh, goes along with uh, with uh, one tip I gave you guys on one or more of my previous seminars. It, like, for example, I've said that, well, if you go to a mature buck effective stand site, all set up for opening day, opening morning, you can't wait to go and hunt there. Lots of buck signing, you know, fresh tracks and or droppings, and, and it's close to something important where the deer would show up, uh, most likely show up like a feeding area or a bedding area or maybe a watering spot. I mean, there's something important there that would guarantee, if the buck isn't alarmed meanwhile, that it would show up there within that short period of time. So if they're all there and you go there and you don't see the buck. Well, there's lots of reasons why the buck was somewhere else, but what happens so often with these super stand sites that my boys and I have found and used in the past that there's probably some good reason why the buck didn't show up that half day that you were there. And uh, especially in a deal like that because it, you hadn't been around that stand fight for two weeks, which is what you should do. Oh, you shouldn't be messing around there during the two weeks before the season begins. Uh, and uh, all, the, all the reasons for the buck being there are still there, but it wasn't there. Now, I've said many times, if you go back there, not the day before or the same afternoon, but go back there four or five days later, the odds are pretty good. You're going to see that buck. <laughs> and it's happened. And one of my sons, John, is particularly famous, has gotten to be famous for that. <laughs> He'll go back to one that he was all excited about four or five days later. You know, here's four or five days without any human trail scent. It's all disappeared now. By four days, it's usually all gone. Uh, the deer was not alarmed by him being there during the previous visit. Uh, so it's almost like opening morning all over again under those circumstances. They go back there, and just like you were imagining during the two weeks or longer that you were waiting for the season to begin, there he is. <laughs> here's the buck, and you get him. So. Now, I've long known that when the wolves are actively hunting in my, in my hunting area during the hunting season, you know, uh, the effect that, that those wolves have on a deer are far less than the effect us humans have on those deer. Uh, we can have wolves rendezvousing a block from our tent and running back and forth for the next few hours, howling and chasing deer and barking. And, and you figure, oh man, we don't have a chance to get a deer tomorrow after all this racket. And then the next day see deer there. You know, they're active. And then each day for succeeding day, it gets even better. Where if a human did that, if you went howling through the woods and making a lot of noise during the day, uh, you aren't going to see any deer in that area for a while. And maybe if it's a big buck, it's maybe gone for the whole season. If you made a buck raise his tail and bound away when you were there to begin with. So that's not good. But four or five days, it's almost like making a stand site as productive as you dreamt it would be on opening day. So keep that in mind. Don't give up on it. Now, us guys, you know, we know big bucks find us quickly <laughs> at new stand sites. And new stand sites never used before are the best ones in the woods, actually. But it isn't because we're sloppy about what we do there. Boy, we minimize trail sins. We do all kinds of things that most hunters never do. But you, buck, those older bucks with the bigger antlers, they're so good at identifying and avoiding hunters that uh, the chances are if you go to a stand site and you don't see the buck there, he knows you're there already and he's already avoiding it. So if 
what you did was minimal, and maybe you tipped off the buck that maybe you should stay away from him. If he didn't raise his tail and bone away, he might just be checking on it during the following days. You know, he will pass down the window. No, oh, he's not there. There's no hunter there. The next day, no hunter there. The next day, still no hunter there. The next day, you're there, and <laughs> he doesn't know because you're downwind. Uh, he, he figures it's safe, and he comes back. So keep that in mind. That can happen. It doesn't happen a lot, all the time. It happens often for my son John, however, at a feeding her. Okay. On the seventh night, we got another photo, and it was another mature buck in the area where, by the gut pile site where David got his buck opening morning. There were three decent bucks in the area. Well, that shouldn't be considered unusual. You know, we've, I've always been amazed by the fact that you could go out there and everything went just perfect, just like you imagined it was going to be, and you got a big buck opening morning. It doesn't take long for those lesser mature bucks that that buck ran off while those are in heat. He's been keeping them away, and he's been renewing his ground scrape, you know, his sense of his ground scrapes and antler rubs every 24 to 48 hours, and man, he's been hunting through that area. He finds a buck, he runs him out of there. And so they're all hiding off branch. He's not too far away from outside that square mile that's owned by that big boss buck. But all of a sudden they start noticing, I don't, you know, the wind's blowing from that, I don't smell that buck. They, you know, they can smell each other a mile away, and those big dominant bucks stink. You know, you get a big buck with big antlers, you know he's got a strong smell of, of musk coming off him. His tarsal glands have been really busy, and the glands on the, his scalp uh, between the antlers, they were busy creating musk. And boy, that buck smells. <laughs> You're probably wondering, I wonder if it's going to be any good to eat. <laughs> well, he will be if you do things properly, but anyway. So they can smell him. I don't smell him. Something's happened. Uh, why isn't he there? And does are in heat. There's a doe in heat in there. I smell it. I don't smell that big buck anymore. And they might sneak off, and you know the margins of his home range are going to have trees with antler rubs with scalp musk on them and ground scrapes with uh, tarsal musk on them. And then he'll come up to a tree that. That ground scrape is, hasn't been renewed for quite a while. It doesn't, doesn't look like it's been freshly pawed. It sure isn't smelling much of musk right now. Same way a lot of antler rubs, you know, they'll put more of their scalp musk on antler rubs after making those, and, you know, quite often, not all of them, and not, maybe not as often as they renew ground scrapes, but they'll do that with trees as well, and then sparks. You know, he hasn't been around here, and that doe is in heat right over there. I'm going over there. And so, four days later, we were back at that stand, and there's a buck. The second biggest buck in the area in that square mile. Here he comes. He's a nice one. So keep that in mind. That can happen. So those four or five days can make a, quite a difference in the effect of a, of a stand slide. That was a disappointment to start with. So keep that in mind. So with that, my friends, <laughs> I'm going to quit for the day. Uh, before you leave, be sure to uh, subscribe and also uh, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. And also, uh, you know, it's June now. It won't be long. You're going to be thinking, well, that's enough walleye fishing for this year or bass fishing or whatever it is. Time to start thinking about deer hunting. When that happens, uh, educate yourself. Become a well-educated deer hunter, and you'll be glad you did. And because from that time on, you're going to have much improved whitetail hunting for the rest of your life. And uh, think of your buddies, too, and your son or daughter who's just starting out deer hunting. There's a book out there <laughs> that will make a big difference in their, your life and their lives as well, and that's my White Tail Hunter, Hunter's Almanac, 10th edition. So, look that up. 
and get your book soon. <laughs> Start learning. Okay, with that, I'll say goodbye, and I'll talk to you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my ebooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries, my website bookstore, and much more.